Okay, welcome back. Uh, before I forget, that was a suggestion yesterday or a remark that the, the class is not listed within applied math, although it, it, it probably should be. Um, I followed up on that and I contacted the applied math department. So I already one email back and basically I was referred to another person. Um, so I hope to make some progress on that. Uh, it will be listed apparently in the computer uh, computational science and engineering master's program as, uh, as what is it special course to take one of the few that that can be taken as a specialty course and I think it's required for that program that you take at least one or, or two I don't remember so there will be an incentive uh, to take this course and in applied math the the plan is to work with the applied math department because I think any Apply math program should have an advanced ODE or a dynamical systems class, which apparently they don't have now, but we'll see. So that's just a brief report on that. Um, where were we yesterday? Uh, I was talking about still uh, fundamental, or I started after some generalities, I started talking about fundamental results for dynamical systems. The use of these is very often they enable you to make powerful general conclusions about the existence of solutions, even for complicated systems, existence, uniqueness, regularity, uh, without actually trying to solve it numerically, or even without knowing details of the equation. And the reason why this is useful, because this is what the, one of the few things, these are the, one of the few things that give you sanity checks or, or, or safety checks, uh, when somebody presents results or when you actually obtain results on your own from a long code or from a long argument. And these are the first things you check. And if they don't check out, then there's something wrong, right? So you will know for sure that yes, there are thousands of lines of code and you don't know the details. Maybe it's not you who's written that code, but there's something is not right, okay? That's, and these are powerful conclusions to make, right? And the other thing is not only to show that something is not right, but also what to anticipate, right? So sometimes you don't even have to run that simulation. Okay, well, let me let me just give you one uh, question that pops up all the time, which I hopefully I'm going to get to today. You sometimes do analysis involving dynamical systems, and maybe you write a report or an article, and it's very fashionable to ask, yeah, 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 that's great, but you have not investigated how oh, the sensitivity of your results. What happens when you change, say, the initial condition slightly or the parameters slightly? Um, are the results going to change just slightly or are they going to change by a large amount? And if you're aware of the fundamentals of dynamical systems, you will be able to guarantee that the results only change by a small amount without ever running a simulation, as long as you know what relevant theorems or what general, general facts apply to dynamical systems in terms of continuous dependence of the solution operator on parameters or on the initial condition. So hopefully I get to that soon, okay? So you immediately know what to anticipate or what to answer to that. And this is where I was last time. I was uh, talking about the geometric consequences of, of uniqueness. Remember that the main theorem, that the, the, the strongest theorem we were talking about is Picard's theorem. It requires the right-hand side to be continuous in T for this differential equation, a general x dot equals f of uh, x of T, right? It's the it's the same equation here. Same general non autonomous differential equation with the initial condition appended x at t naught equals x naught. So the right hand side needs to be continuous in t and locally Lipschitz near the, the initial condition. Then you have a, a local solution for sure, and that's unique. Okay. And uh, if, however, that's a local solution, so then the question comes up. Um, and we were just on a practical note, if that looks like a fancy term, but if something is continuously differentiable, then it's already Lipschitz, right? So if something is smooth, then you don't have to bother checking the details of that. But Lipschitz means that basically the, the function locally falls into a cone. So its variation is not huge. What's non-Lipschitz, an example of a non-Lipschitz function would be whose derivatives become unbounded, even obviously close to x naught. What's Lipschitz? Anything that's uh, continuously differentiable is Lipschitz, but this one is not continuously differentiable yet. It's Lipschitz because the types of slopes you will ever encounter um, between two points are bounded. Okay, 
uh, geometric consequences were that solutions of autonomous dynamical systems will not intersect. The same cannot be said about non-autonomous ones. They have no problem intersecting because the evolution will change by the time they get uh, the second time to the same point. So you will have the two different FFs at that point because time is varying. So no problem with that. But you can even remove that by passing to the extended phase space in which time or space time, if you will, in which time becomes a variable. And in, in that context, in fact, the system always becomes autonomous and that enables uh, some tricks to be used, but it doesn't always help because you lose compactness. Uh, you, this variable will always be unbounded no matter what, right? It just keeps ticking, time keeps ticking. Uh, local versus global existence, this is kind of a surprise, right? It was, it was always a surprise to me that the simplest nonlinear system that you can just come up with, right? Somebody says, show me an example of a nonlinear system. Chances are you would write x dot equals x squared. I mean, I would, right? I have. Uh, and that already has a problem. It, it only, it, it's nice. It's as many times differentiable analytic, and yet it blows up on you very soon, right? So this is then a, a really important question to be aware when you can expect you obviously we are fishing for global solutions we don't want to stop immediately but we would like to see the long-term evolution of dynamical system so when can we when can we expect that this is where i was are there any yes there any questions before i go on um let's let's uh, look into this a little bit luckily there's a, a pretty good general um which is not not the full answer but it's a general guideline as to how uh what what can go wrong and it turns out that what goes wrong in this example namely that the solution no longer exists because it goes to infinity you might wonder that whether there are examples in which you know the solution starts going instead of going to infinity all of a sudden you just run out of ideas how to continue and you just stop because for some reason that formula becomes undefined or whatever right you, you know it becomes maybe it's the square root of of some capital T minus T, and at some point that just becomes an imaginary number, and and you just have to stop the solution in the circle of real numbers. Maybe that's another way the solution can can stop existing. And the answer is no. What you see here in this little example is pretty much what always happens. So if you run out of ideas, you run out of, there are other options to continue a, a solution a dynamical system. That's always because it blows up beforehand. So it goes to infinity in norm. So that's good to know, right? So that's that's just list that as a theorem. And uh, this is uh, you can you can say say this as uh, what what did I call it? Continuability of the solution or lag thereof. It's a pretty simple general theorem, and and. Um, for many of these, um, maybe I didn't mention that, but for many of these, a great book, which which I think has accessible proofs. So I just, I just say proofs. It's it's the the, um, it's it's Arnold's OD book, which I listed at the beginning of the class, and you can find it in the slides. It's just simply called Ordinary Differential Equations. It's very accessible geometric proofs, and this is one of the things that that he proves, you know, very easily uh, with, with, I think, in intuition and, and pictures in, in, involved. But I think that the take home message is the most important one: that if a local solution x t to this general, uh, you know, of x dot equals fxt uh, cannot be continued up to time some capital T. And that capital T is like the time that we had here, okay, in this example. That capital T was whenever is the T naught plus one, right? It does it, it did depend on the initial time, but at T naught plus one, you can't absolutely push it to T naught plus one. So that would be your capital T in this example. And this generally, you know, that's that's uh, larger than the, the initial condition. It's strictly larger because you have a local solution, so you are able to start from T naught, but but 
there may be a time beyond which you cannot go, okay? Then, we must have always the following is that xt uh, goes to infinity as t goes to t. So I have to say that this is, if this is absolutely the point, right, where you cannot uh, continue, because what I mean, of course, you can, you, there could be a further point through which you cannot go, and then it will blow up earlier. But if this is really the first time that, that gives you trouble, capital T, as it was in this case, then, then you necessarily have to go to infinity with your norm. So this is the way solutions break down in dynamical systems, in dynamical systems that otherwise have a nice right-hand side. Of course, if the dynamical system is bad in the sense that it has jump discontinuities and whatever non-smooth, then there could be other ways but, but in you know, general modeling, science and technology, the types of dynamical systems you tend to face, not always, but that tend to face are reasonable, at least lip sheets, most of the time smooth functions on the right-hand side. And in that case, the way a solution so ceases to exist is always prior to that point through which you cannot push it, it always has to go to infinity and norm, right? Now, it might seem like that this is not buying you much because this still doesn't tell you just by inspection, right? Whether uh, it will exist the solution for, for all times or not. It will tell you that if it doesn't, then this is the way that it, it uh, ceases to exist. Now let's see how we can sort of turn this uh, into an advantage and make actually a positive statement. For instance, guarantee just by inspection of a dynamical system, which is non-trivial. And again, I may just have sketchy information about it. How can I buy inspection just by looking at it, guarantee that, you know what, if you get blow up, while you're integrating it, you get the NANs and growing solutions, it's your numerics. So you go back and you need to check that. And there are systems like that. You know, you can easily just the numerics because so, so you have strict variations in the right-hand side, large derivatives, and your numerics just cannot handle it and all of a sudden go to infinity. That's a numerical blow up, right? That doesn't mean that the system blows up. So either situation in which you can really tell the person, no, no, it's not the system, go back, use a better scheme, you know, smaller time step and so on. So let's look at that as such an example. I think in my scheme, numbering scheme is example three. And uh, this will be a twist again on a physical system is a coupled pendulum system. So this is a non-trivial example and it's non-trivial really in the sense that we don't know yet what chaos is. Um, but this system can easily be chaotic, super complicated, because it's not just a single pendulum, but it's uh, two coupled pendulums. So here's a hinge, and here's the beam of the pendulum, and now I'm going to have another one. So in mechanical terms, this is a two degree of freedom problem. Maybe the other one is you're up there. And again, I'm going to be really sketchy with the details, L1, L2, M1, M2. I'm not specifying them. The gravity acts on both. And there will be one coordinate here, phi1, that I'm using to describe the first pendulum and phi2 that I'm using to describe the second pendulum, both angular variables, right? And the twist is um, that, of course, if these are just going on on their own, and then, I mean, it can be interesting motion, but it's not going to be super complicated because this system then decouples into two one degree of freedom systems, right? And so it cannot be complicated. Here's the twist that I'm going to add a completely general nonlinear spring here. So this is nonlinear spring. And that will then enable a transfer of energy between the two in ways that it's hard to foresee because I'm actually not saying what the nonlinearity is. It can be pretty complicated, cubic, quartic, higher order, and so on. But the only thing, it's a spring, so it reacts to displacement. Okay, but the force that it generates can be completely general. So note that I'm specifying very little about this system, okay? And clearly, if it's, it's and, and I can say the, the I, I will say that we see perhaps in part two of this course why, but this system can easily be chaotic.
whatever that means at this point, all right? You've seen examples of the Lorenz attractor that I showed you in the first lecture, which means, you know, going and maybe jumping around. So you can have pretty steep interactions between these two, right? One is just really uh, pushing or pushing or pulling on the other one very fast. And who knows, maybe then things go to infinity, really, or maybe your numerics is not able to deal with that. So that's, let's see what we can see in advance. So the, the way to look at this, I'm not even going to write out the equations of motion, but I take stock of what the phase space is. So my first variable in the phase space, x1, will be just the angular variable. And my second variable will be then the derivative of that, because in order to get, this would normally be two second order ODEs when you do Newtonian mechanics or Lagrangian mechanics. But I just, and I'm not going to write those out because I don't have enough detail, but I, I would just take stock as to what the dimension of the phase space is, what the phase space variables would look like. The third variable will be phi two, and the fourth variable will be phi two dot, right? So that means that the uh, ODE that I have will be like x1 dot equals x2 x2 dot equals that's by definition always right for a mechanical system because the derivative of the uh, position is the velocity so the first equation will always say that and x2 dot will be something and then I have x3 dot for the second equation and x4 dot equals something so I will have some right hand side and given that everything is smooth here um, the pendulum equations are individually smooth the coupling is smooth complicated but smooth I I have at least c1 right hand side so that means that I certainly have a unique local solution to any initial condition to any IVP okay but the larger question is I want to track these solutions because you know I want to see the the details of potentially complicated dynamics so what what can I say long term and mind you this is this example makes one scared because this is certainly much simpler than what we're going to have here, right? These are complicated functions. Um, so here's here comes again the phase space to rescue. So the phase space is let's just uh, take stock. P is the set of x values, right? Such that the first component is taken from S one. The second component, the velocity, the S1 is the circle, right? The symbol for the circle. So we use this notation whenever we talk about a cyclic variable. That um, that was the case already with the pendulum, a periodic variable. The angle it starts repeating itself after a while. So you can think of that component of the phase space as circular. And if you just take one pendulum, then you will add then the velocity to it. There's no such restriction to the velocity because its values can be anything. You can travel in a circle arbitrarily fast in either direction. So the velocity is not confined to the circle. It's always the full real line, plus and minus. So we, we, meant, we remember we talked about this, that when you just take a single pendulum, then the appropriate phase space in which things are really easier to see is the cylinder. So here we have that. For the first pendulum, we have the cylinder, but also we have the cylinder for the second pendulum. So x3 is again taken from the circle and x4 is taken from r1. So topologically, we have a phase portrait, which is s1 cross r cross s1 cross r, okay? So if at this point, I didn't have the r's there, but I just had a phase for, uh, space for my dynamical system like s1 cross s1, for instance, then I would be done with my conclusion, my global, global is existence. Why is that? Think about it. If S1 is a bounded object, this is all you can do. S, the other S1 too. S1 cross S1, by the way, is just the two-dimensional torus. Because you take this direction and cross it with the other dimension. Two-dimensional torus is a compact set, so that the phase space would be compact. Among other things, that means that it's globally bounded. So there's no way you can go to infinity ever. And if you don't have a chance to go to infinity with your variable, then that means you can't blow up. So that means you will be able to continue your solution for all times. Why? Because assume you cannot continue the solution. There's some magic T below which you cannot continue the solution. By the continuation theorem or continuability theorem, that means that you necessarily then would have to blow up before that and go to infinity. But your phase space doesn't allow that. 
so there's no way you can blow up, right? So that would be the argument if I didn't have the R's there. However, the minute I have the R's there, so just remember that for if the phase space is compact, no issue. Compact phase space or bounded phase space, right-hand side, um, nice for the OD global existence. But here, and in all mechanics problems, that the, the R will come in because the velocities are unbounded. So this is not, an, not a bounded phase space. This is a, if you want, this is a torus two-dimensional torus taking the Cartesian product with a plane, R cross R, that's unbounded, not compact, right? So can we still do something? And this is where these can see here. Yeah? Uh, can we just use conservation of energy to bound R? Yeah, so you either have very good insights or you have read the notes or both, but this is where I'm going, right? Okay. This is, this, this is why, I, oh, we're good. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, you're anticipating that. So let's just let's just see how one would one would take care of that. So the one thing that I can immediately say, and what we have already concluded, is that two components, two coordinates, are by the construction of the phase space are bounded for all times. But that doesn't mean that the whole solution is bounded. So this is just by by the nature of the phase space. So the rest is the question. Now comes the my reaction to this very good insight is that indeed energy is conserved. In fact, what's crucial here is not so much that energy is conserved because I could even be losing energy. However, what's important is that I'm not putting in energy because it's usually external forcing that puts in energy that can make things grow in time. Okay. If you're losing energy, then most of the time, there are exceptions, but, but most of the time losing energy is even stabilizing things even more. Um, so energy is conserved. So when I write out the, the energy, which is, as always, the mechanical energy is kinetic plus potential. So what does it look like here? The kinetic energy is easy. We, I just take the individual pendulum kinetic energies. One and a half times N1 or L1 squared. I, I wanted to write phi one dot, but that's really X2 squared plus one half m2 l2 squared x4 squared and i would have real trouble writing out the the potential energy because i've never specified it i know no it's gravitational component but i never said what the spring potential is right okay so this is just the potential energy but the one thing to know, notice about the potential energy that is defined on, or in, only in terms of x1 and x3, because that's what the potential energy is about. It only depends on the positions. And those two components are bounded. And in fact, this one is a function, actually a smooth function, but it's enough to say that it's C0, it's a continuous function on what? Let's just introduce some notation. So this is t squared. This is a t, not a pi, but it's like a bold, what is it? Blackboard bold in, in, in LaTeX. So t squared, which is S1 cross S1, a two-dimensional torus, which is compact. So you have a continuous func function or compact set. So it's going to be bounded in norm. Okay, so then I beyond that, that's one statement, but also E equals E naught, the initial energy, because there's nothing that would dissipate that and there was nothing that would add to it. So if I look at these two equations, on the one hand, E naught is conserved. So the sum of this plus that is a constant, it doesn't change. And on the other hand, I have a bounded function. Then when I express the, the term, the kinetic energy that I'm not so sure about, which let me write here again. So one M1 L1 squared X2 squared plus one half M2 L2 squared X4 squared. Then that's equal to N E naught minus V. Okay, I put things on the, on the other side, right? And this is whatever it is. I take the norm of this, then this will be, I take the norm of that too, 
that's always the case. And I know that this is less than some constant because I'm looking at a constant minus and I'm subtracting something which is a function of the position, but it's bounded. So, you know, in the worst case, worst case would be just apply the triangle inequality and then you get this less than K always because everything here is bounded. So then you look at what you're getting. This is a, a quadratic form of X2 and X4. And the two are squared and you add them up and the squared sum with these appropriate positive weights is always less than a constant. So basically, when it is equal to a constant, this, this defines in the space of x2 and x4 an ellipsis. So that means that for any value of k, these will be bounded. They cannot go to infinity, right? So this tells you that x2 and x4 are also bounded, and for all times, because time didn't play any role in this argument. So you basically have, have that all components of the solution, so both, where did I write that? These are bounded, and I conclude that these are bounded as well. So I then conclude that the full solution in norm is bounded for all times. That means if it's bounded, there's no blow up. And that means by the argument that I used before global existence for all solutions. So here, the, 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 the phase space, the geometry of the phase space was helping already, okay? But it wasn't the full answer because you, you had to use conservation of energy. If you then think back, and if I actually introduce some damping here, which I could denote like that with a dashboard. So I'm dissipating energy. I could also dissipate energy here. Then that dissipation part doesn't affect the potential energy. The potential energy is the same, but the total energy, because of that physical dissipation, would not be constant anymore, but this would be modified to that, but it would be decreasing. And if you look at the argument, then it remains valid because all I need is that this is bounded from above. I'm not this, this is constantly surely bounded from above, but then I could play this game somehow, All right? So the, if I dissipate energy in this problem, that wouldn't change the conclusion, okay? But it really needs to be such that what I have inserted here really needs to take away from the total energy. And then it works for that too. Um, and just to appreciate this again, barely any information in fact you know there's none but all i know is that that this has a potential function that's doubly periodic in the spatial variables no no other detail this system can be and will be chaotic if you start simulating it and you did the right parameters these guys will be jumping around some of them quite violently there could be situations in which your numerics cannot keep up with that and then you know you might run to infinity and yet you will know for sure that that's not a fundamental problem of the model. It's a problem with the, the numerics and you have to refine it. And once again, this can be super complicated, uh, much more complicated than this. And yet this one has global existence, the one that we looked at here and the other one doesn't, right? So nothing is taken for granted, but the conservation of energy symmetries and other insights help. Um, I have seen these coupled, so pendula can be synchronized after a certain time. Can they still be regarded as a chaotic case after synchronization? That's a good point. So that's an old observation. I think Huygens was making that observation that he was working and he had two clocks on the wall, if I'm not mistaken. And they had they were pendulum type clocks and they had no reason, you know, that they were doing their thing completely out of phase. And then he knows, notices that when he restarts the clock, so it winds them up, of course, they're initially completely out of phase. And, and then you say, uh, and, and then he goes like, looks up, wait a second, <laughs> they're synchronized. And then he started playing with this. He, he intentionally desynchronized them. And he noticed that after a while, they are synchronized again, right? Now that was more of a puzzle because they were not connected by a spring. They were apparently you know, completely independent. However, However, 
there were little, little, little interactions between the two for several reasons. If you know these tiny things that one just pushes some tiny air mass in this direction, or they were on the same foundation, so they were kind of vibrating the foundation uh, with the same effect, or maybe sound, or in fact, there's a tiny bit of gravitational interaction between the two. So that ends up being a coupling between the two and the type of coupling that actually makes them synchronized. For that, you typically need, for synchronization, you need dissipation in the system. Because that means that you started from some initial state and you're drawn into this, which if you think about it, or we'll maybe know this, this is actually a periodic orbit in the phase space, which is attracting. So it's called the limit cycle. For that, you need damping. So this system wouldn't do that, okay? Generally speaking. But, but you could introduce damping and then they could synchronize it. Now, to answer the question, once you have locked into synchronization, that then by definition, uh, uh, any more, that, that's going to be a periodic orbit, by the way. A periodic orbit is not chaotic by definition. So when you have synchronization of oscillators, that's almost the opposite of chaotic behavior. It's as regular for an oscillator system as it can get. Okay. Um, that would be, and that's also true for nonlinear. Interactions. Good question. Um, any any other questions? Um, all right. So, is this the only system about which we can say something, or are there perhaps classes of systems in which we can guarantee this type of a conclusion? Namely, something wrong solutions go to infinity or blow up and grow unbounded in norm. Then, should I blame it on the model uh, and revisit it, or or actually accept it as part of the physics, or should I actually revisit my numerics? Okay. Does this result yield global existence for the unbody problem? Now, this by itself uh, is that's a dicey thing. So, the global existence in the unbody problem. Uh, I know about restricted cases in which. So, in in any case where where you would pay a price if you had the potential uh, going to infinity. So any case whereby the a growth of the solution implies that the potential would have to um, go to infinity, and you have a kinetic energy which is positive definite, okay, then, then the safe argument applies. But I don't know if the kinetic energy is given all the, the restrictions with the n-body problem, if it remains positive definite in the coordinate, in the reduced coordinate system. If it does, if you have, you know, kinetic energy, which is a quadratic form, Plus a potential which is which um, which um, is globally bounded, right? Because that was that was a, a key here. Then, then the same argument applies. But I don't think that's the case with the n-body problem. One, one, I think that was a separate argument, if I'm not mistaken. I should know, but I don't remember. Um, but generally speaking, the argument with periodic potentials, potentials that are you, you know uniformly bounded, and with kinetic energies that are positive definite, it always works. Right? Um, let's let's look at the following example: an important class of systems. Yeah, I think it's my example four, and I'm going to talk about linear systems now. And I pose it as a question mark, whether you can expect uh, so linear dynamical systems. When, whether that you can expect or not. So generally speaking, what's a linear dynamical system? Well, that's the dynamical system that you will ever see and not more in most classes. Well, not most, but in a bunch of classes, certainly maybe in controls and other classes, right? So that would be x out equals a t of x, and x is uh, n-dimensional, and uh, a is an n by n matrix for any fixed time. Oh no, that's not. It's not right. This is the this is what I use for n by n matrix for any fixed time, and I'm just going to assume that it's a reasonable linear system. Means that the the matrix, the the only location of time dependence is uh, continuous there. The only location of time dependence is, is here within A, right? And you could say this is a class generally about nonlinear dynamical systems or environmental dynamical systems. Linear systems are trivial. Why do, we, why do we even talk about them? 
I'd like to point out that just because this is continuous, this A of T can be a chaotic signal with all sorts of jumps, very steep ones, right? Maybe you're measuring this as some, some signal from the atmosphere on the output of some chaotic system. Um, and, and, and therefore, it's by no means immediately obvious what's going to happen to the system. Like I said, this, can be, this by itself can have a chaotic signal here. And therefore, then the solution, by, by any expectation, will inherit that signal as well. But the time depends. So don't underestimate the complication that can come from a system like this, right? Among other things, uh, one myth that I'd like to immediately dispel, and, and hopefully you may or may not you know, have heard or, or thought about this, is that linear systems are, are not solvable. I mean, that's the... I'm dispelling the myth of them being solvable. Uh, people have various ideas how linear systems like this can be solved. There's no general way of solving time-dependent linear systems, but a lot of people think there are. Um, that's based on sketchy memories from undergraduate studies or assumptions or everything. I know even, you know, I, I used to have colleagues in applied math departments who were absolutely good at what they were doing, but they still thought that linear systems, you know, with some work can be solved. There's no general methodology to solve linear systems that depend on time. We have a general methodology for linear systems that don't depend on time, which are constant, okay? So that would be the first thing to remember is that in general, no explicit solutions. Or methodologies. So I would just only when the system is autonomous, so A of T is identically equal to some A naught. Yes, then we know, know how to say it's basically the exponential of AT, but not the exponential, exponential of A0, but the exponential of A of T or the exponential of the integral of A of T, those are not solutions. Uh, it's tempting to think that the, the exponential of the integral of A of T is a solution, I've seen that even people sometimes submit research articles, but when you try to prove that, you know, unfortunately there's a point where that fails. And that same point doesn't fail when, when A is equal to uh, a constant. Essentially what you need actually is that the integral of A of T would have to commute as a matrix with A of T itself, okay? And that generally doesn't hold. It would have to be very special, but it always holds when A is a constant. A of t is a constant. So what did I want to say about this? So can be, so given that we can be completely general, chaotic, and given that we generally speaking have no idea how to solve this system explicitly, only numerically, if, if my solver is acting up, is it the solver or is the system that is potentially going to infinity under the assumption that it might actually be going to infinity. I'm not restricting A of T to be bounded in norm. It can go to infinity, but it, it, it does it in a continuous way. That's the assumption, okay? Can, uh, can we still have problems? So let's see that. So the idea would, it, it's all about the norm of the solution blowing up in finite time or not. And I show this because this is a, a classic estimate that, that, that you can use elsewhere as well. Um, so the trick is with these types of uh, systems always is that multiply the both sides by X itself, okay? So what you take is inner product of, I, I give some name to this star with x itself. So what will you then be getting? If you do that, you will have x dot x, right? Because that's what I did. x, x dot, sorry, the inner product on the left-hand side here, because I'm multiplying both sides. Um, but then I can rewrite, and this is sort of the classic trick in this business that I can rewrite that as one half d by dt x norm squared. Because when you write out x norm squared, that's just this, 
the inner product of x by itself, and then you take the derivative of that with respect to time, then you will have x dot x product plus x inner product x dot. But by the symmetry of the real inner product, that's just two times x x dot. So it's two times what you have here. So if you divide by one half, then you get what you have here, right? So this is a classic trick that's used a lot in, in mechanics and these types of estimates. That's good to be aware of because it always helps when, when you try to estimate the norm of solutions of evolution equations, even if, it, if it's a PDE, then this, and you have a time derivative here, this is how people start. This is the first step because you see then it brings in the derivative of the norm of the solution. This is not about the norm of the solution, but this one pre-multiplication immediately puts the norm of solution in plane. So what happens on the right-hand side? On the right-hand side, I'm also taking this inner product, okay? And that's what I get x, dot, x times atx. Now, this is uh, what we call a, a quadratic form, and it has a major role in linear algebra. And when I was learning about these in, in a linear algebra classes in undergraduate, I was puzzled why the professor always said, let's consider a quadratic form where x is some vector, uh, from some space, right? And A is a matrix uh, of the same dimension, M by N, in, and of course, A is symmetric. And I had no idea why we're always assuming that A is symmetric. Uh, why? I mean, just I just gave you an example in which A is a completely general matrix. Why, why would we restrict the treatment and have all these great results for symmetric ones? And I was very proud of myself when preparing for the exam. I realized that it doesn't matter if A was originally non-symmetric, because its asymmetric part never plays a role in this quadratic form. So you can easily forget about it. So why is that the case? Um, just to review that. So I can always rewrite this as X, and I'm going to write A of T as the sum of its symmetric part and the sum of its Q-symmetric part, where uh, the symmetric part is defined one half times you know, A of T plus A of T transpose and omega T is defined as one half times A of T minus A of T transpose, okay? This is usually called even also in fluid mechanics and continuum mechanics or mechanics in general, this is called the rate of strain tensor. When this is a physical problem. So when this is in fact a real velocity field here, and this is some particle motion, which you would have in mechanics as well. And you would have that in, so this would be basically a linearized equation of motion in, in mechanics in a first order formulation and same in fluid mechanics. But, but and uh, this is often called um, the spin tensor or vorticity tensor. This is again the case when, and I just say that in words, when this is a, the A of T is in fact, oh, let me add that there, when this came from, came about from linearization. So A of T is the Jacobian of some velocity field governing your motion. And you took the Jacobian and it evaluated that along a solution. So that happens in fluid mechanics and solid mechanics. We'll get to this shortly, how, why you would do that and why then you would actually pass from a general um, trajectory motion under V to this linearized form, okay? I just wanted to just use this sort of terminology. We'll come back later for the, or if you just have a general math view on this, then it's the symmetric part and skew symmetric part, okay? And then when I continue writing this, so I'm just continuing here, all right? And you say, well, the this I can split this up as x, x, uh, sx. Right, let, let's do that, and I'll, I'll drop the t to to proceed faster. X omega x, right? But this matrix is skew symmetric. So when you feed in a skew symmetric matrix into a, a quadratic form, then you know you will have something omega ij times xi xj, but you will also have the minus omega ij uh, x, xj xi, right? So that those always cancel out. So it's really just the symmetric part that matters. That's the reason why the theory of quadratic forms always involves symmetric matrices. 
I'm still very proud of myself that I figured that out. Or I just didn't pay attention at the beginning of the class when the professor probably said that. That's another alternative. Um, so when the, the rate of strain tensor or, or the symmetric part as uh, is, is in this context is a real symmetric matrix. And it as, as such, it has a, an orthonormal eigenbasis, okay? So I can then represent this quadratic form in that orthonormal eigenbasis. So in order to do that, I just write the general, a general vector x as a sum of going from e goes to one to n, so its coordinates times ei. And, and what this is, what we'll, we'll need, uh, this is an orthonormal eigenbasis. for s of t and, and, and then depends on time as well. Of course, xt also depends on time. So this also depends on time. But then you evaluate, this is orthonormal, right? So when you plug that in here, then this will be tremendously simplifying, even that this will be then just a summation from i going from one to n. When you act with s, on, on each and every member of this summation, then you can skip xi because that's just a scalar term and act with the rate of strain on eit. The eit is an eigenvector of the rate of strain with a real eigenvalue lambda i. So when you act on that, this will return lambda i times eit, okay? And then when you take the dot product of that with the, with the representation of x again, and all those inner products of the EITs and EJTs will be zero when I is not equal to J and will be equal to one when I is equal to J. So when you evaluate this, then you will get lambda I T times X I T squared, okay? And then lambda I, the, the definition of lambda I is from, from, from this eigenvalue problem. Again, I'm dropping the time dependence, but everything depends on time here. And the lambda i's are real because, because um, S is symmetric, okay? So once you have that, then it's easy to overestimate this because it's the, you just pick the largest one. So this is, you have N real numbers. So this can be overestimated by, and I pu I'm pulling that one out, lambda max T, so that I pick the largest of these. And I pull that out, put it here. So that's an upper estimate. And then what I'm left with is the squared sum of the x, where the xi's are the coordinates in an orthonormal basis. So that is just then x t norm squared. So on the one hand, I've had this opening here, opening line. And on the other hand, I obtain that that's less than or equal to that, right? So if I then rewrite my conclusion. I divide both sides by the x norm squared. To, in order to do that, I'm assuming that it's non-zero, which is fine because if it was zero at any point in time, then it would remain zero always. So that only one solution can touch a point where its norm is zero, or zero in a linear system, and that's just zero itself, which is a fixed point for this dynamical system always. I'm not interested in estimating the fixed point because I know that that remains bounded for all the time. So that's not my worry. So I can assume for what I'm doing, I focus on the rest. I can assume that that's not the case. And if it's not the case for one time, it's not gonna be the case ever because that means I'm, I'm away from the fixed point. Okay, so, um, I divide both sides of the, of the yellow highlighted equation. So then I get one half d by dt x norm squared divided by uh, x norm squared. Again, it depends on time that's not less than or equal to lambda max t. So that's a differential inequality. And the argument is that if one function, which you have on the right hand, left hand side that you don't know at this point, 
but you know that it's always less than another function, okay? Then when you integrate these two functions, then the integral, given that it's an additive operation on the point wise values, uh, will always preserve that property that the, the integral of the left-hand side is always less than the integral of the right-hand side. So if I then integrate these, let me add that in a different color, right? From T naught to T, and I integrate from T naught to T, then it, that also remains valid, okay? So do that integration, then you realize that this integral is doable because what you see here is the derivative of the log function of uh, x norm squared, the log of x norm squared. So that will then give you what? So when you integrate this, you will get one half times the log of x t squared. And then you will have to subtract one ha half the log of x not squared because you're integrating between these two points. But then I can take those, the, the, the difference of those two logs and just view it as the log of the quotient of those two quantities. So that then gives me, let me go back to x of t norm squared divided by x not squared. And then on the right-hand side, so I get that, that this is less than or equal to the integral from t naught to t. Uh, to be more precise, I need to switch to s here. I should have done that here. Because we, want, we don't want to use the same variable of integration. Or don't want to use the same variable for the bounds of the integral and the variable of the, the, ver uh, the variable in the integrand. So that should be ds, okay? And then it's really just one step to untangle this relationship and express x of t from here. So that tells you that x of t norm, and I also take them, first I get x of t squared, but then I take the square roots. So that's the, less, than, less than equal to x naught times the exponential of t naught to t, Lambda max s ds. Okay, and what was lambda max as a function of s? Well, that would be just the maximal eigenvalue of the symmetric part of the Jacobian of the right hand side, or which is actually this matrix here. Okay, so what does that tell you? Well, this tells you everything. It basically tells you the following that as long as for any finite time, as long as this this is always finite, that's the initial condition. You're exponentiating, if you're exponentiating a finite quantity, this is always a given number. So the only thing is that this integral has to be a finite number. So the lambda max has to be integrable and have to, has to give you a finite value. But if at was continuous, which I assumed for all times, then this operation of taking its symmetric part is certainly continuous, it's a very simple operation. So S will be also continuous. So the entries of S will be continuous. Now the eigenvalue of a, of a bounded, any bounded matrix will have the same type of dependence. If it will have continuous dependence on the entries, not necessarily smooth, but continuous. And that will then get me here that as long as I have this nice assumption on A, then this, I will not have a problem with this eigenvalue. Okay, so it will be a continuous function of s. So if I integrate it over a, a, a finite time interval, t naught to t, then this will be just a bounded number. So this is bounded and that is bounded. So long story short, for any t in R, the right hand, the, this norm is bounded. That is not to say that it's not growing. Typically it will be growing, right? But the, the, just to appreciate the, the statement of this theorem here, you would need a finite term blow up in order for the solution not to exist anymore, right? So by blow up, you mean a finite time can, uh, divergence to infinity rather than a continuous, because this is not blow up. This is completely normal. And if you have a numerical scheme that's able to deal with that, it can track it but it cannot check anything like that because you in fact in finite time reach infinite norms. So the fact that this is growing over finite time 
or over infinite times is not no concern in terms of the existence, but it's the can it produce an, an infinitely large number over finite times? And, and it cannot, so therefore we have global existence in such liminal systems. Which is good to know because once again, this system could be chaotic. And yet, so with you know, violent, very violent interactions. So once you, once you start thinking about details of what we have done here, so note that this actually extends this conclusion extends to slightly more general linear systems, which would be the, the general definition the, of linear systems, which inclu includes an inhomogeneity as well. So if I did this and, and say B is continuous, but well, it doesn't even have to be that, it just needs to be integrable as it turns out, C zero T, right? Because you could go ahead and do the same type of estimate here, but when you do the estimate, then you would you would get something like this d by dt one half x norm squared less than or equal to again you would have x sx right, but then you would have to deal with this term, which is the inner product of b with x. Okay, and the inner product of b with x that can be upperestimated when you do these estimates. So this can be upperestimated by the norm of B times the norm of X. And once X is not near the origin, but once you're getting concerned about the magnitude of X, that means that it's already larger in norm than one, certainly. And when it's larger in norm than, than one, then this is also less than B times X norm square, right? Because for any number that's larger than one in norm, this is true. So it's not necessarily true for all times, but hey, if you're bounded uh, by, by the unit sphere, then you know you're bounded. So it's, 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 the question is about when you start growing, what happens? But the minute you start, you're out of that, so you're concerned about the growth, this will be true. So therefore, the same estimate works out because B will appear then, so the instead of the integral of T naught to T lambda max of T, now you will have here B, sorry, S. You have B of S in norm, DS, right? And you, you take the exponential of that and multiply by X naught, and I'm just writing everything backwards. This is XT. So as long as BS, BS is continuous, so I, again, I, I have the global existence. which is good to know. And then this is one of the few things then you can really uh, push even further because it said, okay, can I perhaps learn something for, for nonlinear systems? And the answer is yes. The answer is that also the, also the result also extends. If you look at the mechanics of the estimation that we have uh, done here to systems of the form X dot equals, I'm rather in black, F of, t, f of xt, but, but not, not general ones, right? Because I immediately have a counterexample of that here, the simplest one, right? So it's not gonna extend to general ones, but I'm gonna try to extend them to ones that, okay, I'm not gonna assume any conservation of energy or anything like that, but I will be assuming that when I just purely sort of mechanically in terms of estimates, that under what conditions could I perform a similar estimate for, for this general dynamical system, right? And I would work if at the end of the chain of those estimates, I got something similar that I already have, right? Because then I could just integrate this inequality. So if you work through that, then you, you realize that if you assume that this function f of xt in norm can be upperestimated as some time-dependent constant a of t times the norm of x of t, plus B of T, then you're fine, okay? So for systems like that, that can be globally bounded by a linear function. So they, they can be actually whatever you want them to be, and they can be growing, but the growth has to be contained with, with this norm. We, the same estimates work out. 
And the reason is because when you do, the, do, the, do those estimates, you start out the same way and you take this inner product, right? Right at the beginning. That was the first step, but now you have to apply that inner product, sorry, uh, with, the, with this more general right-hand side, okay? Uh, but then you know what to do with this because this is less than equal to X norm times F of X T norm. But for that F of X T norm, you then have this type of an estimate, and then you're in the in the same situation as before in the end. So that's why it works out. Okay, so this is good to be aware of, and this is perhaps I mean there could be more specialized results, but this is probably the the most general setting in which basically you can motivated by linear systems you can uh, um, uh, guarantee global existence for a nonlinear system without knowing anything about it except this bound. All right. And, and mind you, the, 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 the time dependence can be still pretty complicated. So your, yes, your output might be challenging, you might be jumping around and so on, but you will know not to blame it on the model or the person who gave you the model or on the, the physics, but it is you have hope of containing that apparent numerical instability by choosing the right solver and the right step size. Uh, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say about local and global existence. Any questions? Why I'm creating some more pages here to write on. Um, if if not, then another important. Sir, uh, so could you please explain how we got uh, the summation of lambda x i square from the previous step? Um, I wasn't very clear to me. Okay, just please help me where exactly this one. Uh, I said this one, but I'm not pointing. I'm pointing at my screen, but you don't see what I'm pointing at, right? Is was it this? Yes, sir. Yeah. How yeah. we got this from the previous step? Right. Okay. So that is. I was quick there because I sort of assumed that that this rings a bell from from linear algebra, but but if it doesn't, that's all fine. I'm glad you're pointing out because then uh, I need to some spend some detail on this. So let me pick another color here. That's what I'm working on. So note as a line to this, when you have x, s, x, right? Then let's plug in this representation that I do have for any x because I have an orthonormal basis, right? We agree on that, okay? So I just plug in, uh, I carry this, I know it's because I, I didn't, I don't want to, you know, we can just do summation over repeated indices. I'm not that old fashioned, but it's some not to use that, but but some cases that will clash with my notation. So I'll just do this and I write out the summation instead of saying that we use the Einstein convention. Okay, so this, this is a bit awkward because I had to break the expression, but all I did, I, I plugged in this, right? The representation for X and then that. And then I move further and I say, S is acting on this sum. By linearity, I can jump the sum and individually apply S to these terms. But Xi is a scalar, so I'm applying S to, the, to its eigenvectors. Since Ei is an eigenvector of S, when I apply that, when I apply S to Ei, I get lambda times Ei. So if I keep moving along with this one, then I still have the summation here, X, I, E, I, but I have jumped with X, S, the, this summation, and I'm able to evaluate this so that this gives me a summation of X, I, lambda, I, E, I, okay? Now just imagine that I have a bunch of vectors here, bunch of eigenvectors, and, and I, I have a linear span of those with coefficients x, i, and I have the same eigenvectors here that I'm taking the dot product of. These two are dotted with each other, but the coefficients of these are x, i, lambda, i. So I'm, I have all these eigenvectors here getting inner producted, so to speak, with the other eigenvectors. So I do that term by term. So when ei, and I have a term for me, ei, ej, if i is not equal to j, they are orthonormal eigenvectors, so that inner product will be zero, right? So the only terms that stay there in that summation is when I take the products of EI with EI, 
But in that case, since the basis is orthonormal, I get one, right? So when you work this out, then when the dust settles, all you get, everything gets killed out, except the sum lambda i, uh, xi squared. And then, right, and y x, so lambda i comes from here, and the xi was here and there, okay? Does that clear up? Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Anybody else on any other detail here? Okay. So let's move on to another important question that, that will also bring us to the first diagnostic tool that we can deploy when we study a general nonlinear dynamical system and we have no idea what it does, but we would like to get a, a quick reading of the various complicated behaviors in variant sets, potentially attractors or anything in the phase space. But I, to, in order for, to, to derive that tool, I need to step back a little bit and clear up a first a, another fundamental question, which is dependence on initial conditions. People also mention this sometimes, the regularity of the solutions, right? So what is the, the problem I'm looking at? The problem is that I, I have this ODE, continuous dynamical system, continuous time dynamical system. And I let's just assume that the right-hand side is reasonable so that I, at least I have global existence of solutions. And I'm gonna be a bit more specific here. I, was, I, I won't just say C1 and then fine, or Lips is fine, but I will say, let's put actually the highest R here for the smoothness that's available. So if it's seven times differentiable, then it's gonna be seven. So let's go for the highest degree of differentiability. Many times this is infinity here, which means it's arbitrarily many times differentiable. Uh, by the way, that doesn't mean that it's analytic. It just means I can calculate former Taylor expansions or R can be sometimes A as people say, which is analytic, uh, meaning that it actually has a convergent Taylor expansion, uh, which is, stronger than C infinity. And I have this initial condition here, X naught. So this is the initial value problem, okay? So that yields a solution, uh, at least locally. Uh, which I denote by X T, T naught X naught, right? Because it depends on the initial time, the initial location and the current time. And remember a shorthand notation for this using the flow map is that I'm taking this mapping from this two parameter family of maps, depending on the initial and current time, and I apply it to the initial condition. That's the flow map, okay? And the question is then, when we talk about dependence on initial conditions, is that how does, as a function, um, ft t naught, x naught, depend on x naught, and possibly on t naught too. T naught is a parameter that in, in this function, X naught is an argument. But if I look at the solution where it's come from, T naught and X naught actually have similar uh, roles because both of them are involved in the initial condition. So the solution itself is a function, you could say uh, of both X naught and T naught. The, the flow map is, a, is basically just, a, it's a notation difference, but strictly speaking, its argument is X naught, but still it has a dependence on T naught. So what type of a dependence is this? Now, is this just mathematical curiosity or does it matter? Well, it, turn, it, it matters a lot because generally whatever conclusion we wanna reach about a dynamical system should not be incidental to that initial condition. Reason is, that you will never actually reach any initial condition precisely. You will always have some tiny initialization error, okay? And if you didn't have it, then after one step, you will have it because you, your numerical code just will make errors when it evaluates the solution, right? Or even observationally, you will never have perfect observations. Or if you think you do, you're t when, 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 you're, when you have a realization of a system, you're, you're generally interested in multiple realizations, not one outcome, right? So how sensitive is your conclusion with respect to uncertainties and, and noise? So errors and uncertainties in initial data. So the reason why we care is we definitely want robustness with respect to um, errors 
robustness of the solution that is, right? On errors and uncertainties. in the initial data. So this is a very relevant question. Although when you take a, you know, a purely mathematical class of differential equations, it's usually just discussed. And now we discuss the regularity of solutions. And we say, okay, so why is that so important? But it, when you start dealing with physical systems after you, you realize, no, this question comes up all the time. And uh, in fact, if you have a, some sort of methodology that doesn't have this, then you'd better look for another one because otherwise in practice, your conclusions will not hold or they're not guaranteed to hold, okay? Luckily, there's a, a pretty strong theorem along these lines. And again, uh, you can find the proofs in, in, in Arnold's book. And, and it's, it's, it's very easy to remember. It takes a little bit to, to prove a little bit of time and energy and thought, but it's easy to remember. And, and the reason why it's easy to remember because it's, it's, it's kind of the dream situation that what you would hope is true, right? What would be my absolute hope? Well, whatever smoothness I have here on the right-hand side, I'd like to think that the solution will have the same smoothness, right? Why is that, that not obvious? It's not obvious because uh, that smoothness is about the first derivative of the solution here, A, and B depends on the solution itself, right? So I cannot immediately, if this was just F of T here, equal to X dot, then I could immediately say that, well, of course, uh, I mean, the first derivative of the solution is a CR function, therefore the solution is CR plus one, right? Even better, right? Things are not that simple. Uh, because you have the solution contained here and you don't know the solution itself, right? And, the mean, and the, this X variable is more than just the time variable. So I would settle, you know, happily for a general conclusion that if this is CR, then at least the solution is CR, not only in time, but all, and plus what I have just said, by the way, is just an argument about differentiability in time, but not with respect to initial conditions. But but you know, in maybe this, if this was CR, I would be really happy. And that's in fact the case. So if the right-hand side is CR, which I have assumed, but I really wanna point out that it, it actually jointly CR, so the time matters as well, even though I'm gonna be making a statement about the, the initial location, but this has to be a CR function, then generally speaking, the solution is CR. I mean, this is a bit sloppy, right? Because this should be just a function when I, that's the always the, the ultimate sloppiness that this is not a function anymore because I've evaluated it here, right? But let's just, we understand what that means, okay? So what that means, what, what I'm gonna say that this is a C, it's a CR in X naught and T naught. I mean, the more precise statement would be that people put dot here, right? And then dots here, and then you see that that this is this is what you should be writing there. Okay, so that's great because again, this is one of those things that you can just verify again. See Arnold, Arnold's OD because it's verified by inspection, right? So, what are, is the implication if if so? That means, by the way, that that F T naught T X naught is also CR. This mapping. And not only in X naught, but also with respect to this parameter here, the T naught. So the, what's the geometric consequence of this? So when, when I try to think geometry, geometrically as to what can happen in the, in the phase space, In a number of disciplines, we are not interested in a single initial condition, but we are interested in evolutions of, of sets in the phase space. For the reason that I already mentioned that very, very, very rarely does a very specific initial condition have a significance in dynamical systems analysis because of the uncertainty. So you, you tend to draw a little circle about any initial condition, even if you think that, the, that you know it well. So let me draw that little circle here which is perhaps not even so little anymore. And maybe you have your X not here. And uh, I'm interested in how this blob of initial conditions 
which is an initial condition set in Rn, how does that evolve under the flow map? So what that means, we, we, we take this view a lot, right? That, that, that uh, we act on each and every initial point here and let it flow. And then as a result, we will be deforming this blob deforms into something else. I mean, this is why the flow map is called the flow map, because this is what you would see in fluid mechanics if you initialized, say, a, 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 dye, a blob of dye here, and you would follow in flow visualization what happens to it. And, and you can imagine, you may have already seen this, but if, if you haven't, you can imagine that pretty soon this can come become really complicated. But, what I have accidentally done here, that's precisely what cannot happen. This cannot happen. So I cannot really have a, a cusp or, or a conical singularity ever, because that would mean that the mapping that, I, that I'm acting with on a perfectly regular smooth shape is not smooth. So that was just a slip in my drawing. So microscopically, this always has to be a nice smooth surface. It can be complicated, very complicated, but smooth. As smooth as the initial blob surface was, uh, assuming that it was also at least CR smooth. So not only can I take one derivative, but if it was the initial one had CR smoothness here, and this is CR smooth, then that even though this is complicated, I can differentiate the boundary r times at least. So somewhere in here, I will have the image of, X, of my initial condition. And this whole thing will be the image of the blob itself under U, okay? And the thing to remember that, that this is, a, is always a smooth deformation of the original one. Uh, of you. So if then, which actually would happen the minute you started doing this, and it actually uh, numerically, and then you would say, okay, I'm getting something like this, but let's just see the details of that. And all of a sudden, when you start blowing it up, as I'm doing it now, at some level, you would start seeing this. A polygon. And then you could ask yourself, is that something intrinsic to the flow? Or is that just coming from the fact that I have no choice but do a discretization of this boundary, however fine that might be, but I can only do this for a finite number of points. And in between two points, I'm just gonna interpolate, say linearly. So is that polygon the result of me doing that? Or is the flow introducing some sort of non-smoothness? And the answer is no, it's fully the result of you doing that. So that means that if you see this, that's not something intrinsic and you blow it up, you can remove it to the extent, any extent you want just by refining the initial grid. So when you no longer see that, that discrete nature because you have picked you know, 2 million points here, then you should be making progress here as well towards not seeing it. You might still see, that's the troubling thing, that maybe you don't see this, polygonal, poly, uh, nominal, not polygon, polynomial discretization here. And you would say, okay, I don't see anything here. It looks like a smooth circle, but wait a second. When I take a look at my image, I see it there. So it must be the physics. No, it's still not the physics because it's a smooth map. It just means that you have to refine it even more here because who's to say that the level of discretization is here the same as there, this boundary, just got stretched, in most cases, exponentially, right? So what was a good resolution here between two points, all of a sudden, th those two points, one of them is here, the other one is there. So in fact, yeah, what you would see numerically is this. So you would see that the image of this little apparently smooth arc here would turn our system into that. And it's not the physics but you have completely missed this part because that part between the tiny part between the two got exponentially stretched. What's comforting to know is that whenever you, if you were to see, again, you start with this nice smooth and then it would appear like this within an edge. 
comforting to know that that's really just a resolution issue. It's not coming from any kind of non-smoothness in the flow map. So as long as your this is smooth, and that can be ensured by inspection. So this is the uh, the practical a practical implication of that. But then you could also ask, all right, but it, beyond this qualitative assessment, I might in fact precisely this showing this, you know that. There's some bit of dependence on the initial conditions here. It's smooth, but I want to know, but it can still be fairly steep. A function can be smooth, but it can be still fairly steep. So that sensitive, the dependence is smooth, but it can be still pretty sensitive. So can I somehow assess that a priori beyond just having this general conclusion? And the answer is yes. So how do we get to what? To the act that steepness is the derivative of the current positions with respect to initial positions. So to measure that sensitivity, I take the current positions as an n-dimensional vector and I take, take its Jacobian with respect to initial positions. Because that would then really tell me how things, how sensitive things locally are, right? If this is a large derivative, then yes, from that little thing here, I can have this huge lobe. If locally here, I don't have that much sensitivity, then it may well happen that this part of the boundary just maps into that part of the boundary. Sometimes it's this derivative that measures that. So it might, might, would be good to get a handle on that, right? So using our notation, yet another way of thinking of this is this is just the Jacobian of the flow map. And then I don't have to write what derivative I mean here. This is the derivative tensor, the Jacobian, and of with respect to this argument, right? Because it only has one argument then. So that is then differentiation with respect to X naught. So this is basically the Jacobian of the flow map. So how do we compute that? Well, um, let's see if we can, we can work on the equation a little bit. So I, I call this now say double star because I think I already had a star somewhere. And what I'm going to do, I take the, the partial derivative of that with respect to x naught, keeping in mind that even though my dynamical system directly here at this level does not depend on x naught, but there's an implicit dependence because the solution itself depends on x naught, right? So when you differentiate both sides, then you had the d by dt here to begin with. That's the x dot. Sorry. You had that here. And then I'm differentiating with respect to x naught. And on the right hand side, I have f. And I have no dependence, implicit dependence here on x naught, but I have implicit dependence on x on x naught here. So I have to use the chain rule. So then this works out to be the partial derivative with respect to x of the right-hand side, okay? And then by the chain rule, I have to go ahead and then multiply it by this tensor dx d naught. This is a matrix already, a Jacobian of the right-hand side multiplied by the Jacobian of the solution with respect to the initial condition. And that's it because the second slot of f, f contains time and that doesn't depend on x naught, okay? So I don't know yet what to do here, except that when you have smooth enough dependence on things, which, which you do, but that's guaranteed, everything is here, CR, then you can interchange two derivatives here, because first you have taken derivative with respect to time on the solution, because this is just one argument of the solution, and then this is just another argument of the solution x naught. So we know that if these two exist and are continuous individually, I can interchange them. Right. So let's swap the, the order of derivatives. So then I write dx d naught, and then I take the time derivative of that. And it starts looking better because that means I'm, I'm getting actually an order in differential equation for this derivative tensor itself. Okay. This is in fact a linear system of equations for a matrix. So it's m dot equals partial of x with respect to f. And let's just be a bit precise, more precise here, the arguments. In order for me to do this, I had to plug in the solution. This differential equation, I can only, the reason why I'm not getting zero here, right? Uh, although the right-hand side doesn't depend on 
x not at all. This, the reason why I'm not getting zero is that before doing this, I have plugged in the solution into both sides of the differential equation. So I say after plugging in x t t naught x naught into star. Right? So it's already in there. It's substituted. Then I do the differentiation. But therefore, what's left here, I do have the solution. I use this shorthand for the solution because I don't want to carry all the, ah, I carry it because that might lead to confusion. It's just a bit longer to write. And that's where I plugged in T and it multiplies M. So that's called then the equation of variations for reasons that we know in a second, but, but maybe we it's re, we see why that's reasonable to why it's reasonable to call this equation that already so equation of variations because basically this m encodes information about how the solution varies when i vary the initial conditions at an infinitesimal level okay so this is the equation of variations that's that's so term that people use. So this is a linear non-autonomous OD, always non-autonomous, mind you. Even if the original system was autonomous, so, you, so F had no further dependence on time, I have to plug in the full solution here. And if the full solution, so even if I didn't have that slot there, the solution is evolving. So this is always a non-autonomous OD, so we never know almost how to solve this even for even when the original dynamical system is autonomous so remember that right because again that's something people often forget the only place where we know how to solve this even when this is a fixed point so it doesn't change at that point all i'm doing i'm basically linearizing i'm substituting locally uh, the the equation with, the, with its linearized form but this is somehow a linearization in the large right along a whole solution rather than along just a fixed point. So that's this is what the equation of variation does. So it basically, what it gives is linearized dynamics along xt. And I'll, I'll get into that. But, but even, I mean, actually, this is probably the, the right, no, <laughs> this is not the right one, because then I, I need, need some other notation. Before I get to that, and I have to probably not stop here and not get to that, but let's clear up one thing. This equation has infinitely many solutions as any differential equation, right? So I seem to have a problem because I asked the very specific question, fixing a solution, what, what, what's the Jacobian of that solution with respect to initial conditions? And I expect a very specific answer. There's no uncertainty involved here. And yet, all of a sudden, I'm getting infinitely many answers because this equation has infinitely many solutions. What's the resolution to that? Well, it's the, the same resolution as we always have in differential equations. Yes, you have a differential equation, but in order to get a unique solution that's of interest to you, the one that you were looking for, you need to specify an initial condition. So I now have to specify an initial condition for this ODE, but I have infinitely many choices. So what is the initial condition that is consistent with what I'm looking for. Because I could have just written out this ODE and say, wait a second, I have infinitely many solutions. So need, a, need an initial value problem. So, so what is the relevant initial condition? For, let's call this triple star. So for triple star, and I'll move it a little bit because I'm getting mixed up here. First, let me give you the, the wrong, I grabbed some of this dynamics along. So first, let me give you the wrong answer, the, the, the wrong reasoning, <laughs> right answer, wrong reasoning. Uh, Wrong reasoning. Uh, I would say, oh, okay. Well, this initial this uh, solution is 
at time t naught is just x naught. So therefore, when I'm looking for the derivative of the solution with respect to x naught, then it's clearly the identity because the derivative of x naught with respect to x naught is the identity, okay? Why is this wrong? Well, it's wrong because I need to look at the solution as a whole thing, right? Take, that's what this equation is for. It's for its derivative as a function of time. I need to then take the derivative with respect to x naught. And once I have taken that, then I should set t equals to t naught. That's what an initial value problem does for that. I need to write out the solution, differentiate with respect to say time in this case, but it, or, or yet put it another way, I have to have an expression for m and then specify the value of m at t equals zero. So first I have to write out what m is. So I have to differentiate the solution with respect to x naught and then set time equal to, to zero, as opposed to taking the solution just right there without ever changing a time and differentiating that value with respect to x naught. That's not the right argument. That means I've interchanged the two without really knowing uh, how they relate to each other. Okay, so what would be the right argument? The right argument would be I need to get a handle, at least formally, on that on the derivative. So the, here's the dirty trick for that, which is the poor man's uh, way of solving dif differential equations. Uh, maybe I haven't said this before, but it seems like we can solve each and every differential equation just by where was my differential equation here? Just by integrating both sides, right? So why not? I integrate both sides, then on the left-hand side, I get x of t minus x0, right? So I put the x naught on the other side. Like I said, it's the poor man's solution of differential equations. But on the other side, I already had the integral from t naught to t of what? So I cannot integrate just x as a spatial variable, which would come here, but I can, you know, integrate Along solutions, so I just put in x s t naught x naught s ds. So this is always true for any differential equation. The reason why this is the poor man's solution is that it's not buying you much in general. It buys you actually a lot for some some cases for estimates, but it's not really hasn't really answered the question because x t appears here, but it also appears here. So that it's, it gives you a, an implicit integral equation for the solution. So what this is, is the integral, it's the equivalent integral equation. Which are often easier uh, for the OD, which are often easier to deal with, okay? And then on this one, I can execute this operation at t equals t naught. And you see, then when I differentiate this, it gives me the identity for x naught. And here, I know that things are smooth, so I can just jump, well, I, I need to jump the integration sign and do the differentiation of f with respect to x. And then I have all these arguments here, but by the chain rule, I need to hit this one with differentiation as well, dx dx naught. And uh, that's it, ds. And of course, I don't know really what this is, but the point here is that I have already guaranteed that this is a nice function. It's not, it's, it's, it's bounded because that's what the main theorem tells me that this is a smooth function. So there's not gonna be any funny business when I then set the time equal to t naught here. So I take the limit of t going to t naught, which means that the, the integral the, the domain of integration is shrinking to zero. And I could still have a problem with this blowing up, but the Jacobian of F is not blowing up because it's a CR function. And this Jacobian is not blowing up either because it's also a CR function. So what is the limit of this? Then this is just zero. So I do get that this is the identity even by the strict argument. So the missing initial condition is M at T naught equals identity, right? So I have this on the one hand, and I have this on the other hand. So it's a matrix that starts from the identity, and then I get a unique solution. It's a matrix differential equation, which can be viewed as a regular OD if you put the matrix elements in a column, and then we are in the usual setting that we have looked at so far in this course, okay? 
I'll stop here. Sorry for going over time. That means that next time I'll stop five minutes earlier. And I just want to make sure I finish this one. Any questions? So I'm now set up actually to move on to, the, to that diagnostic that I promised you. That's what I'm going to do next time. An overall way of very quickly assessing a nonlinear dynamical system and finding interesting things just from a scalar function that you can compute using these ideas, equation of variations. Okay. The, if there's no questions, I'll stop for now. And, and we are starting, uh, if all goes well, there was already a practice or a problem session uh, on a Monday. Was there? Is that correct? Am I correct? This Monday, which was? I think the next, the first one is next Monday. Okay, so I wasn't correct. Thank you, Ahmed. So next one, next one is next Monday. So please be aware that before you see me, then there will be an opportunity to look at the first problem set, which will be Jane. And then I come back on, on Tuesday. So have a good rest of the week and see you in a week, about a week, next, next Tuesday. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.